By law, every Indian child has a right to education, but is it worth having? Is it creating a competitive modern state or consigning the country's dreams and ambitions to history? I'm the outsider, this is our motion tonight, education is sinking India. Speaking for that motion, Kiran Mazumda Shaw, Chairman and Managing Director of Biocon Limited, Government Advisor, and named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. And with her, Mohandas Pai, former Chief Financial Officer at the IT giant Infosys. He's now Chairman of Manipal Global Education Services. Against the motion, Fraser Mascarenas, for the last nine years, Principal of St. Xavier's College here in Mumbai. He's also served on numerous education committees and initiatives. Also against the motion, Pramath Raj Sinha. He's Managing Director of 9.9 .9 Media Works, formerly with McKinsey Consulting. He remains an advisor to the company and serves on the board of their Knowledge Center. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our panel. Kira Mazunda Shah, could I ask you, first of all, for your top points in support of the motion? Yeah, I'd like to focus uh, this debate on the criticality of providing the right education and not merely the right to any education, which is what the government is aiming to achieve. And, uh, you know, I really believe that if you start scaling up and expanding substandard education without focusing on quality, I think we have the really serious situation where education can hurt and hinder economic growth uh, rather, and potentially sink us. And, you know, I really believe that our educational system is flawed. We have fundamental flaws in the way we educate our people. We focus on imparting information rather than applying knowledge. And, you know, as a result of this, we assess students uh, in terms of rote learning and remembering, as opposed to their comprehension skills and their ability to think, query, and, you know, basically apply knowledge. So, to me, these are very, very important aspects to consider. And if we don't fix these flaws, I'm afraid we will create a, you know, pool of graduates who are going to be unproductive and even incompetent. There are many, many damning statistics that can qualify the statement that I've made. You know, in fact, McKinsey and other reports have actually stated that 75% of our engineering graduates, 80% of our MBA graduates, and 90% of our, uh, you know, professional qualified people are simply not making it to the employability cut. And this is a very, very serious situation. Even OECD, we know, ranked uh, India 71 among 73 countries under the PISA evaluation, which was, you know, which stands for the Program for International Student Assessment. Could so you come to a close, please? These are very, very serious uh, indicators which tells you that our educational system has to undergo radical reforms or it will sink us. Kira Mazum Dushaw, thank you very much. You talk about the danger of education hindering economic growth. Sounds strange when you're the second fastest growing economy in the world. Where is this sinking affecting India that you're talking about? You know, we as a country need to create and provide employment, gainful employment to 500 million people. Yes, and you have poverty rates falling. You have the number of rich people rising sharply. You have an ever-expanding middle class. Where is the sinking going on? The, the rest of the world sees India forging ahead. Yes, so what I'm saying is that if you have to consider the fact that, you know, almost 12 to 20 million people have to join the workforce every year, are you creating right, the, the right kind of jobs or are you going to create notional jobs? Well, you are creating wealth in India that wasn't there before, that wasn't there 15 years ago, aren't you? Yeah, but if you You're look at You're creating substantial amounts of wealth. You are, but it's, it's, no, it, it's a small ecosystem. You need to expand it. If India needs to realize its aspirations of being a global economic powerhouse by 2050, then no doubt education is the key 
to this kind of, uh, you know, yeah, growth. But it's, but it's forging ahead. The indicators, many of the indicators, I know you cited some from McKinsey, but many of the indicators are up. We have the development, human development uh, report in 2011, which said all round increase in literacy in the country is taking place. But I think all round increase in literacy. But no, that's literacy not a good step is forward. Very different. You know, we think we, if you look at literacy indicators, they're very poor. Today, no, 30% of class one students can't even recognize one to 10 numbers. Now, these are not good indicators. So literacy is very different to education. education so the Human Development Board didn't know what it was talking about. Well, you know, it depends how you measure any indicator. It depends what is important for a country. Education is education reaching is parts of very society. Different. Education is very different, Tim, to... Uh, you know, literacy. You're halving the number of girls who were excluded from, from school before. That's gone down between 2006, 2011. That's gone down by 5%. So there's no debate that education is very important. But there's it's no the debate right that it's actually kind. getting better. It, is it may be, but you, need, but you need, it's going the, right, in the right direction. No, you need the right kind of education, and you have to scale it up fast. We don't have the time. We don't have the luxury of time to experiment and grow, grow right. slowly. Kira Mazumdashor, thank you very much indeed. Could I ask, please, Fraser Mascarenas to speak against the motion? Your top points against the motion, please. Yes, I think uh, I'm speaking not just as the principal of St Xavier's College but I'm also associated with a whole group of schools and colleges across the country which are run by the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus. And I've also been associated with different think tanks uh, at uh, Delhi and elsewhere. Uh, I have visited uh, schools and colleges across the country and even abroad at the invitation of the governments of UK, the US, uh, recently Australia. And I think from this experience, uh, I'm very hopeful of the type of education that is taking root in the country. Please look and see that we have fantastic human resource. And the indication of that is all the students uh, from India, or a large majority, are doing exceedingly well abroad in the highest competitive uh, universities. We also have uh, academicians in any of the top universities of the world, you have Indian academicians. Now, could they reach those levels if they came out from a vacuum? They have had a very good foundation here, and that's the reason why they are not only doing well in universities, they are doing well in business, in entrepreneurship, in research across the world. Secondly, I have been associated with the Government of India efforts for example, I, uh, with a group of uh, professors from uh, uh, Mumbai, we met the Prime Minister of our country, Dr. Manmohan Singh, and we talked about in this global world, by 2020, India will be one of two countries to have a surplus workforce. And we said we need to give our students global skills. And his response was very clear. He says, and if we don't do that, Imagine the type of social unrest that our country will see. And so he was seized of the urgency and the importance of education. And the government, I think, has been doing its bit to kickstart education and to take it along the right direction. Could you, could you close, please? Yes. Uh, finally, I think it's uh, really also the hope of the country that uh, civil society is also getting its act together and supporting education. I would give just the example Please, no, of, we, uh, we need to come to a close. Yes, Please. okay. Please. Mm -hmm. Fraser Mascarenhas, thank you very much indeed. I want to talk about this fantastic resource that you say education is. Um, one and a quarter million teachers. That's the, the deficit. That's what you don't have in this country. One and a quarter million. How can you say it's a fantastic resource when you're short of so many teachers? Well, I think, you know, it's uh, very clear that uh, education has expanded because of the expanding population. Overnight, you cannot get those teachers. How but is education precisely... expanding when in Uttar Pradesh, for instance, in a thousand primary schools, they have no, not one qualified teacher? What, yeah, kind of, are... what kind of education is expanding under those circumstances? I would, uh... Not one qualified teacher. Yeah, I would agree to that. Uh, the, because of the expansion, we cannot really man all these schools that have been started. So that part, of course, is the darker side Just of the story. Just you can't I'm man all of, of them. You can't man many of, of them, can you? You can't man many of them. 
Yeah, but uh, the expansion has been needed and it has been, uh, you, you know, all At the of cost of standards, 60% of grade four children cannot read at grade two level, according to the World Bank report. 76% of grade four children can't do simple division in mathematics. No, I think every country in the world is, is exper experiencing this. For example, well, we're talking in the about, US... We're talking about India here. No, but we're talking about standards in India would, here. You say it's a fantastic resource. Would it be possible for me to make a comparison because, uh, for example, uh, President Obama speaking to uh, children in America said very clearly, if you do not buck up and uh, compete with uh, India, Indian and ch Chinese children, your jobs will be taken by them. Uh, in America, it's very clear that uh, they are hyping up the type of results. There are a lot of studies done by Americans. Uh, They're in not getting way. the dropout rates that you're getting. One in four children leaving before grade five, almost half before grade eight. That, that is, you're uh, getting that is, huge dropout rates. That here. is something we have to address. But I'm, I'm talking about the country moving in a direction in which the government has seen that and is investing. But it can't move investing. unless the resources are there. You That's don't have right. the teachers, and the teachers you do have are not up to standard, are they? Yes, but uh, the, you have teachers. The, I mean, we've been reading in the press in Mumbai this week. You have teachers who beat up students. No wonder uh, a large number of them don't even want to go to school. Well, as long as they're not shooting people, as is happening in other parts of the world, I don't think we <laughs> so, are the so, worst. So beat, off. beating up I is don't okay. Think we are the worst. Off. <laughs> beating up is fine, is it? It's not beating fine. Is up, beating up's it's all not right. Fine. We have to address those issues. As long as they're not cutting their heads off in class, that's fine. <laughs> all right, Fraser Mascarenhas. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Mohandas Pai, could I ask you? for your top yeah. points in support of the motion, please. I support the motion that education is sinking India. In the, in the, in the primary school education, of, we only we have about possibly 65% of students completing standard 10. Uh, completing in the sense they go through standard 10, they do not pass standard 10. Only about 30% of students go through standard 12. 17% of children in the age group of 18 to 24 finish college. And out of the 17%, 40% do a course called arts, which almost has no meaning. And then if you look at education system, in the top 400 universities in the world, as per the Times ranking, there's only one university from India. If you look at the Shanghai ranking out of top 500, there's only one university from India. And if you look at research papers, India produces something like about 40,000 research papers. China is 150,000. America is 250,000. The impact analysis says India's impact is only 3%. China is some 8%. The United States is maybe 25%. So if you look at access to education, number of children completing, we are, education is failing India. If you look at higher education, education is failing India. And if you look at the policies that government has for higher education, about 60% of colleges are run by politicians who do it for to build the public and take money. And if you look at this IIT system, which is God's own system, 82% of people who go to IIT go to cramming schools for one or two years. And after they finish the cramming school, they come into IIT in the first year, they don't do well, if you ask the professors. And 500,000 kids sit down for an examination where there are 10,000 seats. No country in the world disappoints 490,000 young people in the brightest years of their life by a very bad system. Even if you look at the IAMs, about 80% of the people who go, go to cramming schools. So we create an educational infrastructure which is very elitist, which is anti-poor, which does not care, take care of India's need. Yes, like Tim said, India has grown at 7% a year for the last 25 years, but India could have grown at 9% like China. And I won't take China now as an example. Our literacy rate is 74%, China is 97%. China has got 30 million young people in colleges. We got only about 16, 17 million young people in colleges. If you could come China to has close, gone ahead. Please. Twice what India has done. So I believe, compared to a potential, our education system is sinking India. All right, Mohandas Pai, thank you very much indeed. You say no country is disappointing its young people like India. Yes. You haven't looked at Spain recently. The 50% well, unemployment rates, uh, people between ages 18 and 24, you don't think that is more disappointing than the 8% uh, graduate uh, unemployment rate that you have here in India? Well, Spain, considerably more, isn't it? Well, I don't believe the 8% is right because the data that government of India collects is not right. But if you look at Spain, they're not starving. They're not on the streets. They're not in Srinagar throwing stones. They're not in Eastern India taking to guns and fire, becoming Maoists. They're not going on the streets and doing and joining yeah, politics. Yeah, but there is also another India that is progressing in world class, isn't there? As we, as we pointed out earlier, the second fastest growth rate in the world. Second, this is a huge achievement. Yeah, Some, but we, something must be fueling that. And no, obviously education is fueling it because you, these big industries, like the one you used to work at, Infosys, are finding the people they need. One way or the other, yes. they're finding the people they need. Yes, Tim. 
Jim, you're right. The big companies are finding people. When I was HR director in Infosys, I hired 150,000 people in five years. But to hire 150,000 people, and you worked with colleges. You set up campus resumes. connect, yes. didn't you? We had to look you at worked five, with colleges. We had to look at five million resumes. The cost of getting these people in, the cost of training these people, the hassles of training them, the lack of productivity of these people is enormous. So the pain of doing what we need to do succeed in India is so very high. I the wonder if you're the same. There. I wonder if you're the same, Mohammed. Uh, Ma Mohandas Pai, rather, Mohandas Pai, who wrote in Forbes magazine earlier this year that India has an enviable higher education infrastructure. You praise the fact that it's got 530 universities, 26,000 colleges, three and a half are engineering courses. Yes, I did that. Three million people in engineering courses. I, I, I you did. praised it to the heights. I now it's gloom it. and doom. No, no, I praised it to the height compared to what we have done in the past, but compared to the potential India has of becoming the fastest growing economy in the world, the leading economic power, our education system is sinking India. If education but more system children delivered... have access to education than ever before. According to the government of India, in 2008, 94% of India's rural population within, lived within one kilometer of a primary school. Absolutely. Not you bad, are... is it? It's is very, is very right. It's taken us 60 years. It's it doesn't matter, but years. it's there. You're a it poor country. There. It is there. We are a poor... You're a desperately poor country. But we are not poor enough that we don't educate our children. 400 million children haven't had education last 60 years. You're poor years. enough that you're not feeding 2.1 million children a year who are dying before the age of five. One million of those are dying before they're six months old. So you're poor enough that you can't feed 2 million children a year. Yes, we are poor enough that we don't feed these children, but we are rich enough that we have these IITs where we subsidize 800,000 rupees a year per year so that 100 children die so one child can go to the IIT system. Now, now Tim, I want to add another point to this higher education debate. Yes, Briefly, we have 260,000 young Indians studying outside. It is so difficult to get in the IITs, you can get into an MIT. What kind of system is it in India that you create a say, college where it's, it's so it's, difficult it's to get quite an achievement that It's quite an achievement that they can get in there, isn't it? It's, an achievement it's quite because an achievement that they get accepted school. to the top colleges in the is, world. That's my point. You, you've got to go to a cramming school and waste two years of your life. Pai. And when you come out, you're almost brain dead. All right, Mohanda Pai, thank you very much indeed. Now let me please ask Pramath Rajasinha to speak against the motion. Your top points, please. Uh, Tim, my first top point is that you have us on the wrong sides. Uh, these two uh, people who are actually for the it's motion often the case, have, you know. have actually benefited from the education system in this country. Biocon and Infosys would actually not have happened if we didn't have a great education system in the country. So it's actually Father Mascarenas and I who are actually fighting the, the, the sinking uh, battle and trying to get us out of this morass by creating and running institutions. Uh, I'm here because of my record of being involved with setting up the Indian School of Business. Kiran is uh, on the board, which has within a period of seven years become one of the top 20 business schools in the world. Uh, I'm now involved in creating a university. I'm involved in uh, launching a program called the Young India Fellowship and so on. Uh, it's with that context that I'm here. Firstly, I think that uh, we have traditionally have had a strong foundation. That point has been made. Is stuff, uh, are things wrong with the Indian education system? Absolutely. Everything that has been said about what is wrong is absolutely true. We all know it. But I think we need to get on with it. There's a question of the looking at the glass half full or half empty. I think we are not sinking. Sinking is too strong a statement to make. I think things have actually bottomed out. Things have turned around. And the reason they have turned around is that we are all sick and tired of hearing about these problems. So there's a bunch of us, and actually that includes all for us of sitting around this table, who, have, who are actually going out and trying to fix things in our small way. There are problems with health in India, with corruption in India, with governance in India, with politics in India, with urban infrastructure in India, with agriculture in India. There's problems with everything. And the simple reason for those problems is the massive amounts of population that we have. I think the good news is that we are past that point where we were sinking. I think the initiatives that people are taking in building schools, in, in Mohandas Pai runs Akshay Patra Foundation where he feeds 1.5 million kids every day so that they can go back to school. These kinds of initiatives are what give me hope that it is not sinking. Are things wrong? Absolutely. Is it sinking? Not anymore. Thank you very much indeed. How can you get on with it when you don't have the teachers to get on with it? 
Pramath Raj Sinha, I how agree, can you get on? I agree that we don't have teachers, but there are equally efforts underway to fix that. So Azim Premji is putting in $2 billion to build Azim Premji University that is only And how many focused. teachers will that have? I don't know the numbers. Well, it's but it's not going to have much to, to deal with India as a whole, is it? 21.34% of your teachers actually have no professional qualification I agree. to get up in front of Absolutely. a class. Absolutely. None but whatsoever. Somebody, somebody has to fix that problem. But they're not therefore, fixing it. The government has actually allowed, okay. them, yeah. allowed them to, to stay stand up in class. So we can from, keep blaming the government. With, with no fair, qualification. Well, we who don't else need, is going to do with it? No, the private sector will fix it. And people are fixing it. So Premji is private, fixing it. The private uh, sector can fix India by itself. I think it can't completely fix, but somebody has to, and they are taking a charge to do that. I mean, Father Mascarena has gone ahead and, you know, become an autonomous institution. This is the first college in the university system that has done that. Why? Because he's taking the initiative to do that. We are all fighting the system to make it and, better. And where are the centers of excellence that are going to lift India out? You have not a single Indian university in the world's top 100. We, you will see it not in the next 10 Indian years. Indian you will see it in the, in the top... next 10 years. In the 50s, you shone in universities. It'll turn around. There's, there, but Prem, you, 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 can, is, you can go on saying it and you can go on quoting Mr. Premji, but he's not going to save India single-handedly, no, is he? No, he's not, but so you don't have the facts. There's, there's Shiv Nadar who's building a university, Rajendra Pawar who's building an IIT university, there's Jindal Global University. We are building Ashoka University. ISB has already the proved facts that are, model. The facts are that three years ago, two Indian states who took part in the international testing system, which is known as PISA, out of 74 regions worldwide, the two states managed to beat only Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. Then you can only that, go those, up those from there. Those are the facts. You actually, can only go actually, up you could be worse than Kyrgyzstan no, next time. No, you can only go up from there. No, you can go down one more place. I don't think so. You don't think so. All right. Pramath Raj Sinha, thank you very much indeed. We're going to take a break now. When we come back, a question to the audience. If you could have your education all over again, would you choose to have it in India or somewhere else? Answers in a moment. Join us then. Welcome back. During the break, we asked the audience a question that goes to the heart of their own educational experience here. If they could go back to school and start again, would they choose to be educated in India or somewhere else? The result is in. 49% said here in India, 51% said abroad. Kiran Mazumda Shaw, it doesn't sound as though everybody thinks the education system is sinking. Quite a lot who think it's done. They'd rather stay here. Well, 49%. Well, but 51% said they'd like to have it outside. Not much in it. Not and much think, in it, is I there? I think the main reason why I think that... Well, the fact is that there is a huge number of people who would rather be educated abroad. And why is that? Again, I get back to the point. A lot of Grass young people... Grass is always greener on the other side. No, a lot of young people today who are educated in India find it very difficult to get the employment which they think they are entitled to. Okay. And that's because, again, they haven't made that employability cut in terms of high-end jobs. All right, Fraser Mascarenhas, quick reaction to that. Well, I think... You feel uh, vindicated by that? I think, yes. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a hopeful sign that people are convinced that not only is uh, the education good, but it is getting better. I think that's uh, the hope, and all the signals are in that direction. All right, well, we have a lot of young people who presumably are going to argue that point, among many others, over the next uh, half hour or so. Uh, the motion before us is that education is sinking India. Uh, we're going to take your questions now. Uh, if you stand up and uh, when we get a microphone to you, we'll be glad to have a lady in the first row. We'll be glad to hear from you. I'm Vani Tripathi. I belong to the main opposition party of India, and I work with a lot of young people. My first question to... Uh, Father, is that you were talking about quality education in India. The education minister recently said that there's a 12 and a half lakh deficit of teachers in India. Where does that take our classrooms to? Who's going to teach in them? And also to uh, When you Mr. say lakh, could you translate that for uh, the uh, that's audience almost, abroad? That's almost... Uh, 1.2 uh, million. Yeah, 1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And also to Mr. Pai and Ms. Shaw, of course, well, let's just, convincing let's just take arguments. that question first. Sure. 
Professor Mascarenas. Well, I think, you know, just as there's an expansion of uh, schools in India, if you look just at Mumbai, there is an expansion of teacher training colleges. So you have to give the country time. This expansion has just started. It does not happen. Teachers are not prepared overnight. Father, are we just looking at the urban cities of India and thinking that's where India lives? India lives in its villages. It lives in small district centers of UP, Bihar. Uttar Pradesh was a question that uh, Tim Sebastian spoke about. Are we only looking at the big cities of India or are we actually looking at where India lives, which is called Bharat, which is probably another part of the country? I'd, I'm happy to say that uh, the organization that runs St. Xavier's College has just opened a junior college in Maharashtra, fully funded by the government of Maharashtra in a remote tribal area. And we are not the only one. There's a whole series of these things that uh, the government of India is, uh, and uh, of Maharashtra is supporting. We have, for example, at St. Xavier's College, 25% of our students from the backward groups of, of uh, Indian society, fully paid for by the government. Don't you think we are also then uh, extending ourselves to that section of uh, Indian society that most needs education? All right, Mohandas so. Pai, I'm going to bring you in yeah. here. The point I want to make is let's not look at small, small uh, centers of excellence. Zewes is excellent. They start 10 schools is OK. India needs 2 million schools. Now, we got maybe 100,000 schools. They're very good. India has got 41,000 colleges, 5,000 colleges are very good. What about the rest? We must look at the country as a whole. We are 1.2 billion people. We're not a small country. We're not a, small, not a country where we can have only 15 IITs with 10,000 students. We need 100 IITs, 100,000 students. Faisal so Mr. let's Karenas. look at it on scale. I think, you know, we have uh, got used to that press button society. You press a button and you get things out. No, with education and with everything that is deep, it has to be built up. Yeah, but the is question the is, momentum, is it going in the right direction or the wrong direction? Is the momentum in the right direction? I think so. And I think one very let me just one, hear back from the questioner yeah. briefly. Yeah, just one, just one very small uh, question to Mr. Pai and to Ms. Shaw. If education is sinking India, is reservation a part of it? No. 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 Is, is reservation a part of no. it? No. Reservation no. and education a part of it? That no. is what I wish to No, no. You not mean quotas here, don't you? Okay. You're talking about quotas. Yeah, not yeah, quotas. at all. Not I do all. not believe that's the reason. Yeah. I really believe it's the fundamental flaws that I talked about. We are not developing problem solving as the way of teaching people to query, to have a curiosity, curiosity driven learning. You know, we are just getting into imparting information, like I said. <laughs> we are creating a breed of students who cannot solve problems, who cannot add value. If you cannot create that kind of education, we are not going to be able to grow Bishop, our economy. Bishop Cotton School in Bangalore, where you went, did pretty well for you? Did very well for me, but you know, as, as Mohandas Pai said, that's a very small number of schools that do that. And Tim, Tim, there is a solution. Imagine we give a tablet with preloaded software and education material to 200 million children. What happens to them? They play, they, get games. Empowered. they play games. No, they don't on the play tablet. games. They Even get if empowered. they play games, they learn. <laughs> they learn. They, they learn, learn through okay. games. Okay. All right. Exactly okay. what the government so is we, doing. We they need innovation. Akash has come from the government. Ta Akash is very bad. Tablets for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Gentleman in the first row. Yes, in the pink shirt. A student comes to a college to get a job. So my question is, who is the onus for employability on? If it is the educational institution, are they failing to? Uh, to manage to do what they should do. Fraser yes. Mascarenas. I think we have merited this reputation of uh, only rote learning in our institutions. That is not something that I would want to deny. But the point I'm making is that there has been a turnaround. Take, for example, colleges across the country that have become autonomous. We were held in the stranglehold of the university and a very uh, the common system of uh, 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 setting syllabi, designing courses, and taking evaluation. Not anymore. St. Xavier's College, for example, is, uh, along with many other colleges which are autonomous, implementing the Bloom's taxonomy, which is talking precisely of doing, you know, giving those type of critical skills, creativity, application, which our country needs. But there's so no my employability. Point is that there is there's a no turnaround. employability, is there, when firms in Bangalore, outsourcing firms in Bangalore, are having to outsource themselves to countries like the Philippines and Nicaragua because they can't get the Indian graduates to speak and converse as they want them to. Or are they finding graduates uh, who are cheaper there? No, that's no, not a question of money. They can't find the people to do the job. Not cheap. But Tim, so. how did they get here in the first place? Right? I mean, Mohandas Pai, you want yeah. to say something? No, 
again we're coming, how do they come there? You know, we've gone 50% ahead, we could have been 100%. We must speak between potential and reality. Reality is pretty good compared to the past. Yes, we've done well, but what is the potential? Look at China. We, China and India started at the same time in GDP in 1978. India is today 1.8 trillion, China is 7.1 trillion. Why? 98% literacy in China, investment in education. Everybody's got a primary education. Education system is working better. I Much more research. I want to come Look back. at the potential and reality. I, That's want to come the thing. I want to come back to the questioner. Um, you said you were a student two years ago. Yes. How employable were you when you left? Do you have a job now? Um, thankfully, I was a student of St. Xavier's College, so the kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 so it's payback time. It's, no, 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 not at all. <laughs> um, there, are, there is a huge gap between the premier institutions yes. of this country Absolutely. and yes. a large number. And the problem is that Corporate India is not recruiting only from the... In fact, it's extremely expensive to recruit, to recruit only from the premier institutions. And so they're, not trying, they're, they're not enough. It's not enough. It's, the numbers are not adequate. So while there are definitely some institutions which are really... Top, you know, they, somewhere, top underlying, top somewhere underlying all of this, Tim, is the, is the assumption that the government has to do something about this. No. The country is not the government. We all have to do something about it. And the moment we start to look at the glass half full, but Pramad, and I think we education will do something about it. is regulated by the yes. government. And I that, think that's Too much is made to out of that. No, but Too much is to made out of that. Uh, actually, it's quite easy to start a university today. If you actually go it's to a government... It's not about starting the university. It's about running the it's university. It's about running the university. Even running the university, I'm sorry, is not that difficult. Pramat. Pramat. No, it's, not it's not about difficult. the curriculum. Pramat. It's about the Pramat. teaching system. We have a... Mahanas, we have a 19th century... We have a 19th century framework for a 21st century education. That our universities do not have autonomy. There's corruption in the education system. And people are trying to fleece many young people by making sure only politicians get the license. If you're a good person and you want to start a university, they will not give you a license. It's a rotten system. It okay. is failing India. All right, lady in the first row. Hi, my name's Lena Asher, and I run a, a chain of private schools, Kangaroo Kids in Billabong High. And uh, my question is uh, to you, I understand we don't have to point at the government for, every, for anything and everything. And I'm, I'm lucky enough to have uh, been sort of had half my education here, half in Australia, and came back here to try and make a difference to the rote learning sort of style of education. But no sooner do entrepreneurs like us sort of come up and start doing things and the government comes and access us in some way or the other. What I'd like to ask you is why can't the government just completely allow privatization of education and universities, um, just like they do have done the airports and other things that have benefited from it. Tax us, don't, don't let us run as trust, tax us properly, and okay. invest that money in education. And, and, that, is and, and that is happening in some but, states. But the point so, is, the no. is the government part of the solution or part of the problem? Think, She's suggesting I, it's part of the problem. I think, I think she is right. I have, I, I, I have faced all of the problems that people are talking about here. All I'm saying is that even within the country now, there is a rethink on a lot of this. I can give you an example where we are setting up a university in Haryana. We went with an application to the government. We have complete freedom to do what we want. We did not have to pay any money to anyone. We were completely supported in setting up the university. And as long as you are doing it not for profit, and you are doing it for the right reasons, people will support you. Now, there, it's not happening across the country. It is Kieran happening Mazen in some states. Is there this rethink? But it is going Do you to see this rethink asked... taking place? Can I just... I'll come to you in a moment. But Kieran I Mazen think we need radical reforms. We are here talking about just starting up universities. I think it's much more serious than that. We've got monumental challenges in education. You just mentioned the deficit of teachers. You've talked about this huge deficit of every possible aspect that is required to sustain education, which we don't, we are not addressing. The, I'm, the I'm, going back, I'm going back to the, the question here. Exams. And have you heard anything that comforts you? No. No. Okay. All right. From yeah. either side. From, from either a, from side. From either side. Okay, gentlemen in the front row, we'll take your question, please. So my question, sir, is this: that when do you think that by deregulating higher education? the money for the government which is going into higher education should really go into primary and secondary education. Sure. And that is not happening. Yeah. And the other thing which the panel has completely missed is that there's no talk about vocational training and skill building. Okay. Pramath And that is missing yeah, completely. I, 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 I think that deregulating is of course the answer. Privatizing education is of course the answer, but I'm a practical guy and I can tell you, looking at the politics of this country at this time, it ain't gonna happen in the near future. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's, it's a pipe dream to expect that the government will allow private education 
regulated private education to happen in this country. So I'm not defending the government's position. I'm just, I'm, I'm against that position. I think privatization is good and it should happen. And government should focus on primary, but it's not going to happen. So what do you want to do about it? We can come and come here and keep debating this. Are we sinking? I think we are not sinking because some people and a lot of people in this country are having a realization that it is hopeless to expect that the government is going to change anything and that others of us have to go and do something so about it. So you just bypass the, bypass the government? Absolutely. No, I would, uh, I would uh, focus on uh, you know, the potential uh, that my friend spoke about and the type of efforts that are being made. Take, for example, the Teach for India uh, uh, initiative father, here based on... Father, potential in reality, you need is, 10 million... This 10 is million the beginning. This is, father, please don't this, speak at once. This please, is don't, a please don't everybody speak this at once. This is the beginning of a rash of initiatives. This is not... I gave you one example and you're saying that's the only example. I don't think that's fair. Father, father... We if, have a huge... Father, and this, believe, is, okay. this is precisely tackling that... Uh, 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 the, the population that requires it. Father, okay, those are the underprivileged. Father, 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 if we believe that a group of well-meaning individuals can change this country, it's not going to happen. We need change in policy. We need the opening of the system. We need thousands of people to come into the education system. For example, vocational education. 10 million children require vocational education every year. 1 million get it. 9 million are untrained. No country wastes his human resources and refuses to invest in his children like India. In the 12th plan, and there is know, a 12... huge initiative now uh, just starting on skills uh, 60 uh, years we lived on hope that we get a better India. We not got it yet. Okay. We got lived another 100 years. All right. Father, we want it tomorrow. Lady in the centre there, yes. Hi, my name is Kanika Kosa. I actually am from Teach for India. Um, my question is to both of you. We are expanding, but the quality of education we're expanding with, is it staying the same? Is it deteriorating? And what about primary education? I work in, for a fourth grade classroom in a BMC MC, MCGM school. And morning shift, we have two teachers for eight classes. Half of them sit in the staff room. They don't teach. We have two Teach for India fellows in the afternoon shift that take care of four classes. I myself have 60 kids. The quality of education, we're expanding, but our quality is not staying at the same level or increasing. Are the children learning anything? In some classes, there are where we can give extra time and more effort and indiv um, individual attention. But in general? But no. I walked into a second grade classroom. More than half of them don't even know one, two, three. Right, Prime Minister, that, think, that's, that's, not think, out, no, that's not bottoming out, is it? That's not bottoming out. That's that's heading further here, down, isn't it? No, she is a symbol of why it is not bottoming out. All of the people sitting in this room have to go out and start teaching in our schools, and we can again go back to the government and say, "What are you saying? She's not to... doing enough?" Oh, I think she's. I'm saying she is. I'm saying she is the hope. She is a symbol of why we are not sinking. And anymore. she's telling you that the hope isn't there. But my yeah. point is, there are not enough of us, and I agree. the people that the I people agree. that are pre-existing in these schools, I agree. their teachers, their BMC teachers and MCGM teachers, that there's no teacher training for them, and the teacher training that they have. Yes. It's not good enough but don't because you they think, come back uh, to the staff room. Don't you think the government has recognized that and now the BMC is asking private parties to take charge of these schools? Precisely that is being recognized and uh, it, is, uh, it is being addressed. Agreed, but it's not happening at the rate of our expansion. Yes, it's and just... And you're, not, you're right. not noticing any change. We, at your we don't have the resources to expand. Mahandas we need Pai. to expand, Mahandas but we don't Pai. have the resources. Look, this the is a people, proposal that's Pai. just coming. Pai. Yes. The people who have to run the education system, who are paid by your taxpayers' money, have to do their work. Now, you are doing a great job, I salute you, but you are a poor substitute for the system not working. You are a quick aid, a quick fix. But that's not the fix we want. Exactly. We want the people to work there, and that's why we say education is sinking India. It's not working. It's uh, the quality of education that we are talking about, and which is what you said. Exactly. Okay, gentlemen in the first row. <laughs> this is Agnello Rajesh here. I'm also into the business of promoting skillful education. Apart from that, a lot of economically challenged students, but academically brilliant students, find cost of the education as a deterrent to take professional education. What can be the solutions in the combination of the government and the corporates coming together? 
Here in Mazunda show, why don't you try that one? Well, I think there are many models of doing that, but I think if education is going to be such a driving force for economic development and economic growth, I think government has to start investing in education. And therefore, PPP models will work in this kind Public of Public private partnerships. Public private partnerships. Government spending is uh, a big example to the past history of this country that government spending doesn't reach to the last mile. Yeah. A lot of money gets filtered and it doesn't reach the last mile. So how can there be a marriage between the government and the so corporates and the private, private entities? Sector yeah. has to st you have to create a model where private sector puts the checks and balances, where you have the government investing in, in scholarships. Something good is happening in this country where even the corporates are an education system. For example, Infosys. Even after the student finishes his education, in Infosys he's trained for six months to two years. So why that need is to be there? That need should not be there. He should be job ready right the day he finishes his professional education. I agree. And, I agree. And that's the pain of running business in India. I've not met a single company and I probably met about a thousand in the last five years who have said that the people the high from college meet the needs. But you expect to, put to money do into some training. vocational training, don't expect you? expect to do some, maybe 20%, 30%, not 100%. And not spend enormous amounts of money and take away management time. Industry could have grown maybe 50% more if they were ready, if the people who joined them were ready. That is the challenge. Sim, see, can Tim, the, the point panel, about, can can the the panel, let, let, the point, the point about the model, uh, there are several models that are already emerging in this country, and this is a solved problem worldwide. Of course, the government has to invest, but if the government can allow us to charge people who can pay and use that to subsidize people who can't pay, that's how this model works everywhere. And this is starting to happen. All right, lady at the back, right at the back. Uh, it has been debated that uh, we are producing rot learners and crammers. But isn't that what the corporate is asking right now? Because we have all the back-end jobs. We have all the outsource job where we don't actually encourage innovators and entrepreneurs. Is that what no, you're asking for in the corporate no, I, sector? I, I, I think you're very mistaken because uh, the initial years, you're taught to work and have a process and have the rigor, and later, you're taught to be innovative. And nobody prevents innovation. It's left to you to be innovative. No, when you actually take up innovation and entrepreneurship, you want to start something new, you're actually shunned away. No, you're not. You just have to leave the company and start yourself. Yeah, that, there are 100 problems. <laughs> That's the same thing, yourself. isn't it? <laughs> no, but, That's the same thing. But, but <laughs> No, but companies want it to work. See, let's not mistake what companies want. Everybody in the company cannot become an entrepreneur, right? You got to, you, if you, you got to sell your idea as a, as a person with an innovative idea, others have got to buy the idea. If, if you've got an idea, unable to sell the idea, you can't blame but the company. But Mohan, she has a point, and I'll tell you what the point is. The point yeah. is, we just started this program in the liberal arts and humanities, right? The fact is, corporates in this country only want engineers and MBAs. That's all they care for. And I think you have to put the, some of the responsibility for that on the companies in this country also, that they value only a certain type of education. And therefore, we've seen a mushrooming of engineering and business schools who only provide that kind of rote learning. So because they think all, if we, all we need to do is create an engineer and this guy will get employment. Around the world, people are not so obsessed with just hiring engineers and MBAs. For lots of jobs, you hire people with history, political science, international relations, English majors, including in England. Even and in and then teach them something it's completely science. different. Pramath, okay. I want to also mention that our sector, which hires a lot of scientists, <laughs> yes. we give a lot of weightage to innovative thinking. That's good. For us, creativity and innovative thinking is paramount. That's and why we, we are not we thinking. we find that that's where we have an and issue. And how much of that are you finding? We are finding a huge challenge finding that kind of talent because the kind of education we have here is not curiosity driven. It is not project driven. It is about rote learning and, you know, it is really about just acquiring information. They are not able to apply their uh, knowledge. That's the big okay. challenge we find. All right, lady with the sunglasses, yes. My name is Preeti. I'm a professor with St. Andrews College in Mumbai. Uh, I'm observing that we only are talking about the employability quotient since we started this debate. In my classroom, my target in front of my 100 plus students is not only giving them a job. We have so many other aspects to take care. So I want to know panel's views on this. So you educate people to know as well as to do, is that right? Um, yes, sir. We are talking about just employability, economy, percentage, GDP. But then there are so many other things when I deal with my students. I have so many other things in my curriculum, in my classroom happening. 
So it is not only about uh, translating into GDP or economy or something. Professor Mascarenhas, you'd agree with that? Sure. Yes, I think so, because uh, uh, it's quite clear that in the global economy, you cannot teach in our educational institutions exactly the skills that they will be needing as soon as they get into the job, because the job is changing so quickly. What we need to do is precisely what uh, this lady is talking about, give them life skills, give them critical thinking, give them the type of creativity that will help them to solve the new problems that are constantly changing. And that's the effort that is going on in many of our institutions, which but, the government is backing and funding. But Kira Mazanda... Yeah, but when we talk about employability, we're not just talking about jobs in industry. We are talking about you know, self-employment. We are talking about teachers. We are talking about entrepreneurship. There is a, you know, you've got to gainfully employ yourself. That's what we're talking about. So yes, your holistic learning is very important. And I agree with you that it shouldn't just be focused on getting jobs at, at companies and specific jobs. Now, there's a big difference between, again, education and vocational training. I think you raised that point. Vocational training is about you know, performing tasks. And education is about solving problems. So you've got to have both. We need, you know, nurses, plumbers, engineers, just as much as we need, uh, you know, economists, uh, doctors and uh, teachers and what have you. So I think you do need both types. And I think what you're talking about is, it's not just focused towards getting a job in an industry. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the point of the proceedings. We're going to vote now on the motion that education is sinking. If you want to vote for that motion, the side represented by those on my right, you're going to need to press button one. If you want to vote against the motion, the side represented by those on my left, it's button two. Whichever button you want to press, please do so now. <laughs> All right, the vote is in, the audience has spoken. 70% of you say education is sinking, 30% of you say it isn't, so the motion has been resoundingly carried. Let's just take a look at the result before the debate. The vote then was 54% in favour of the motion and 46 against. So there has been a 16% swing in favour of the motion during the course of the debate. <laughs> Quick reaction, Fraser Mascarenas. Well, I think, you know, we need to, in India, accentuate the positive and not just harp on, you know, the mistakes that have been made. We have to accentuate the, pro the positive and to acknowledge the good that is happening. I think that is showing that we are in a direction that will be positive. Pramath Rajasinha. I'm where father is. I think uh, I have no disagreement with all the problems that have been pointed out. I think we are all seeing that every day. I think what is the solution to, to constantly expect the government? Of course, the government has to do it. I am only of the view that we have to look at the glass full, half full, and actually start doing something about it than constantly pointing the finger at the government. OK, Mohandas Pai, you probably don't take much comfort in this victory. No, I, I would say that as Indians, you must stop living in a make-believe world where everything is goody-goody. Except reality, reality is not good. Work to change reality and make sure education takes this country forward. We have to invest, we have to change policy, create an open system, and every child should get educated. <laughs> well, I agree with uh, Mohan. I think basically if we want to realize our demographic dividend, then education holds the key. There's no debate about that. But it is the quality of education. It is the right education. It is not simply the right to any type of education. Because I think we need radical educational reform starting with... The Starting with facing how bad things actually are. Absolutely, and we need policy changes and we need a lot of these experimental models that will help us to scale up very rapidly. Right. And I personally believe technology holds a very important key to that. Okay, all right. Well, we've come to the end. My thanks to the panel. Thank you very much indeed. To the audience, both here in the studio and around the world. Please keep in touch with us via our website, www.theoutsider.tv. Till the next time, from the Indian city of Mumbai, good night. Mm -hmm.